Hello, and welcome back to GI 101. My name is Dr. Dan Sadowski, and I'm a gastroenterologist at the University of Alberta in Edmonton. In this podcast series, we will be discussing common clinical problems that arise from the GI tract. With me today in the GI 101 studios is my co-host, Dr. Adriana Lazarescu. Last week, we discussed constipation. Adriana, what are we going to discuss today? Well, I thought that we would move up in the GI tract and discuss the clinical manifestations and diagnosis of achalasia, which is an esophageal motility disorder. Okay, great. But before we do that, why don't we review how a normal swallow should work? Sure. You see, after a person puts food in her mouth and chews it, the food bolus will be propelled to the back of the throat by the tongue and soft palate. The pharyngeal muscles propel the food bolus forward towards the upper esophageal sphincter, which is also known as the cricopharyngeal muscle. The upper esophageal sphincter relaxes and opens, and the food bolus enters the esophagus. As soon as that happens, the upper esophageal sphincter closes. This is called the oropharyngeal phase of the swallow. The rest of the swallow consists of the esophageal phase. It is important to remember that the lower esophageal sphincter opens at the same time as the upper esophageal sphincter. It stays open until the food bowl passes into the stomach, then closes again. Many people do not realize that it takes several seconds for the food bowls to pass through the entire length of the esophagus and into the stomach. If you have ever swallowed either a very cold or very hot food, you will remember that sensation slowly passing through your chest. You're right. Whenever I eat ice cream, I can feel it as it goes down. So does the ice cream just go down with gravity? Gravity is responsible for only part of that. The food bolus is mainly pushed down by peristalsis, which is a contraction wave that propagates down the esophagus in a smooth, coordinated fashion. This is why people can swallow upside down. That's cool. And so now that we know how a swallow is supposed to work, what happens in achalasia? There are two defining features of achalasia, and they are both necessary to make the diagnosis. First, there is no peristalsis in the distal two-thirds of the esophagus. Second, the lower esophageal sphincter does not relax during a swallow. I have heard that there are also other abnormalities that you can see in a patient with achalasia. That's true. They include a high resting pressure of the lower esophageal sphincter and spasm in the distal esophagus. However, they do not occur in all patients with achalasia and are not necessary to make the diagnosis. So what symptoms do patients with achalasia present with? Patients with achalasia generally present with progressive dysphagia, with solids and liquids since they have no propulsive power, meaning peristalsis, and the esophagus cannot empty properly since the lower esophageal sphincter will not relax with swallows. Patients may also describe so-called bland regurgitation, meaning that they bring up food that tastes just like the meal that they ate and not like stomach acid since the food has not had a chance to enter the stomach. Patients may also complain of chest pain either due to spasm in the esophagus or due to fermentation of food that stays in the esophagus. Doesn't sound very pleasant. It's not. Eventually, patients with achalasia start to lose weight since they throw up or regurgitate so much of the food that they eat. I've heard that some patients get heartburn. Do they actually get acid reflux? Patients with achalasia can get a burning sensation in the chest that they may describe as heartburn. However, it is not due to acid reflux since the lower esophageal sphincter does not relax to allow acid to come up into the esophagus. That burning sensation is also due to stasis of fermenting food in the esophagus or any retained pills. So now that we know how patients with achalasia present, how do we actually confirm the diagnosis? All patients with suspected achalasia must have a gastroscopy. This test helps to rule out pseudoachalasia, meaning other conditions that mimic achalasia. These can include a cancer at the G junction, sarcoidosis, amyloidosis, Chagas disease, and a few other rare conditions. What if the patient has had a barium swallow? Is that enough? A barium swallow will often show a dilated esophagus that tapers into a so-called bird's beak. There may also be retained food in the esophagus that is noted. However, a barium swallow can also miss achalasia, especially in the early stages, as well as some of the conditions mentioned earlier, which cannot be ruled out on a barium swallow. Bottom line, a barium swallow is helpful if it is suggestive of achalasia, but it does not replace a gastroscopy. So, does a gastroscopy clinch the diagnosis of achalasia? 
A gastroscopy is necessary but not sufficient to confirm a diagnosis of achalasia. The definitive test is an esophageal manometry study, which can measure whether there is any peristalsis in the esophagus and whether the lower esophageal sphincter opens with swallows. Achalasia is a very interesting condition. One last question, Adriana. What causes the disease? You left the hardest question to the end, Dan. The esophageal motility abnormalities seen in achalasia are due to an imbalance between nitric oxide and acetylcholine neurons in the esophagus. Both types of neurons are decreased, though nitric oxide neurons more so. This leads to the inability of the lower esophageal sphincter to relax with swallows and the loss of peristalsis. Inflammatory degeneration is thought to be the underlying mechanism, but we don't know what triggers it. Okay, thanks for that review of the presentation and diagnosis of achalasia. We hope you have found today's podcast useful. Join us next week for another episode of GI 101. Bye.